I'm Robert Wright. I'm a fellow at the New America Foundation. Um, and thanks, Andrew, for that great presentation. I think you, you drove home uh, at least a couple of points. One is that uh, DNA is digital information, no less than computer code, and is in principle um, as infinitely manipulable as computer code. And the other is that uh, there's no reason uh, to believe that we will not see uh, a kind of uh, accelerating rate of change uh, in, in the field of synthetic biology George, just as we have um, in, uh, in computer science. Hello, George, um, can I'm you not hear sure me? everyone uh, is as upbeat about that as Andrew sounded. And, and uh, one, one thing we'll be, we'll be looking at Hello, today is, uh, is uh, whether we should be. Okay, um, in fact, okay. the, the, the title of this can you hear the panel is the also? Perils, uh, of Synthetic Biology Today. Uh, and I've got okay. uh, several people very well qualified to talk about it. Okay, they're going to come Sarowitz, to you in a little bit. Um, is uh, at Arizona State University, but is actually based here in Washington because he's a policy guy um, and has some very interesting ideas about uh, the relationship of policy to science and technology, as we'll be hearing. Um, and you are uh, the associate director of the Center for Nanotechnology and Society. Uh, and if we had time, I'd get into a kind of a Jesuitical question about the diff exact difference between nanotechnology and synthetic bio and which is a subset of the other, but we don't. Um, you're also the co-director of the Consortium for Science Policy and Outcomes. Um, Robert Sawyer is a uh, science fiction writer. Now, I, I understand there are three major awards you can win as a science fiction writer for best novel, and you have won all three. Is that true? Hugo Nebula, John W. Campbell Memorial. And yeah. only seven people in the history of the universe have won all three. Is uh, that right? There's now an eighth, but yes. Uh -huh. Oh, an eight. Okay. Yeah. And that's this, Hello, year. That's this universe we year. should specify when I'm talking to a science fiction writer, but that's still. And only one in Canada. That's and you're true. Canadian. That's me. So I'm I, have, Canadian. I have no choice but to call you the Dean of Canadian Science Fiction Writing. Globe and Mail says that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Now, finally, I was going to say that we are very lucky to have a truly uh, seminal figure in the field of synthetic biology with us, George Church, but uh, he uh, weather prevented him from flying in here, and uh, notwithstanding the rapid progress in synthetic biology, we were <laughs> unable to reconstruct an organic version of George Church on such short notice, maybe if we'd had a week. So we're left with an audio-visual uh, manifestation, but I think for, for these purposes, that's really uh, the main thing we need. Um, he's at Harvard Medical School, a professor of, uh, of genetics and the director of the Center for Computational Genetics. Um, and he wrote the first uh, automated DNA sequencing software ever. Um, and I think was ahead of everyone else by, by years on that. Uh, and also, uh, along with Walter Gilbert, did the first direct uh, genomic uh, sequ sequencing method. Um, so uh, far and away, he has the most hands-on experience in synthetic biology. So George, I thought we'd uh, start with you um, and ask you to, to uh, give us a sense um, for what, what we can realistically expect. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the good things you hear about are, you know, uh, <clears throat> new kinds of fuels that are clean uh, or, or, or little microorganisms that, that, that take the unclean things out of the air, uh, new ways to cure disease and so on. On the bad side, you hear about, uh, you know, bioterrorism and so on. Um, maybe you could, you could uh, let us know in either category or both what kinds of things uh, we can expect that we don't have now, five, ten, maybe 15 years down the road, whatever you're comfortable with. Or I could raise questions about whether my audio is making it to Boston at the very... He didn't laugh at your jokes earlier. That's, so that's either the there's no signs. audio or he's a very either doer man. Either means I should quit making jokes or I should, <laughs> or I should start raising questions about yes. the... Uh, okay, thank you. It takes a long time for those electrons to get here. Yeah, uh -huh. it's, uh, Boston's a long way from well, here. I, yeah, so I can hear you fine. Uh. <laughs> well, thanks for adding some drama to the moment. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, I'll just I'll, I'll just uh, launch into your question about uh, five, ten, twenty years from now. Yeah. So. Um, These, the, uh, to really 
to really think uh, uh, concretely here, uh, we have to consider the fact that costs can drop. They can drop by as much as a million fold in six years. Um, in the case of reading and writing DNA, a little bit more slowly for the computer industry that, that Andrew Hessel just told us about. Um, and so, in principle, all food, drugs, fuel, materials, phones could be as little as half a kil dollar per kilogram uh, because that's how much that biological systems currently can produce uh, very complicated structures for. The, um, we have uh, the dragons of uh, no technology. That is to say, if we don't do anything or if we go back even a, a few decades, uh, we can't support the number of people that are currently on the planet, maybe a, a three billion fold. So when we're talking about technology, it's not just synthetic biology, it's all integrated synthetic biology with all the other technologies. And this is basic access to clean water, food, roads, and education. And this may not sound super high tech, but I uh, would predict that in the next 10 years, uh, synthetic biology will continue to uh, integrate with these better and better. And when we go forward, we're, we don't want to just, we don't want to talk about just what we're, what we don't want, but what we do want, humane cities, predictable agriculture, affordable personal health. You know, right now, agriculture is, <clears throat> without technology, would be cycles of drought and famine. And with it, we can reduce that. So as we move from about 3% of us to 80% of us living in cities, uh, the uh, family structure changes from a rural average of about 7.5 children to about 1.2 children per family in cities. Um, so for sustainability, we have synthetic biology on cyanobacteria, which can turn carbon dioxide into food, building materials, and uh, clean energy and clean chemicals. Um, it can do this possibly at tenfold higher per square kilometer. And in lands that are marginal agriculturally, not useful agriculturally, possibly preventing the spread of deserts. This is, this is not that far in the future in that we already have companies like Juul and Limited, um, uh, which is um, making such um, uh, carbon dioxide into, uh, into green chemistry. Um, we may see less travel, like we're seeing today, uh, less uh, consumption of, of meat, which is about uh, as much as 15 times more uh, costly than, than uh, directly uh, than, than vegetable matter and cyanobacteria, conceivably even less costly. So I think, you know, we, we, we're seeing more and more uh, safety and surveillance in our lives, and this includes biologicals, surgery uh, that we can do today is uh, was unconceivable a few decades ago from a safety standpoint. Same thing for vaccines, even though they get in the news for whenever they're not safe, they're overall greatly improved public health, as has uh, clean water and other hygiene. All of this can be part of synthetic biology. Heart disease has plummeted by a factor of two in many countries. Um, adult stem cells are really working well. Um, that they're, they've gone from basically impossible to routine uh, DNA nanotechnology and other molecular nanotechnologies actually work um, uh, very predictably, and we're starting to see the first um, pharmaceuticals being produced by those technologies, the smart, smart pharmaceuticals. So uh, this is uh, probably enough for now and leave time, more time for discussion. Okay. Uh, now, can you hear me, George? Yes. Okay, just one follow-up. What, what exactly do smart pharmaceuticals do as opposed to the kind we're used to? And what, what's an example of one that might be on the horizon? Yeah, yeah. actually the, uh, the, the Skype version is coming in kind of broken up. Uh. Okay, so maybe we will uh, let people Google that question on their, on their, uh, on their smartphones. But, uh, uh, Thanks. We'll, we'll hold off for a second. Let's go to the other end of the spectrum. So this is somebody with, with a lot of hands-on experience, and, and maybe you have a little. I don't know. It, sound, it sounds like anybody can do this stuff biology. now. Right. Well, I touch we, it all the time. We all do. We are it. The, um, but, but you're a science fiction writer, um, and uh, I'm, I'm wondering, what is, what is the far end 
of, uh, of the speculation, uh, let's say the speculation in the literature that seems even remotely plausible to you? Well, if it's science fiction, it is at least remotely plausible. It's not fantasy. It's a literature of reasoned extrapolation from what we know now to what might reasonably, plausibly be in the future. Um, those of you who read my article in Slate last week that came out of this conference, I kind of set the groundwork for that there. Uh, I think that what we're talking about, and it's exactly what we were just told, is that the cost of sequencing is coming way, way down. The speed of sequencing is going way, way up, uh, which means that the manufacturing of synthetic life Anything that's possible in the idea space of those four nucleotides being recombined into anything you want will be doable, not just by big corporations, but ultimately, and by ultimately I mean before the end of this century, by individuals. We talked about uh, in the opening foundational talk, garage labs. The idea, uh, and this is I guess where it touches on to governance, the idea that you can uh, regulate something that people can do in their basements is going to be the biggest problem here. Once the equipment is widely available, a decade ago I was writing about, I called them codon writers, but uh, devices that let you essentially word process life forms. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have people doing it regardless of what we say industry can do because individuals will be able to do it. Talk about a $5,000 device now, it means it's a Cracker Jack prize mm -hmm. in 10 years when you get the device that lets you write or design your own DNA. So we're talking about making life utterly malleable, utterly reconfigurable, and not only that, but utterly uh, novel in the sense that, you know, what Venter did was, was boot up one uh, set of uh, genetic material in another uh, genetic shell creating completely from scratch, as we learn to understand, how to read that book of life that you referred to. It becomes authorship of life, not just by big corporations, but by individuals, as we go down the road. That would be the vision for the decades to come. Mm -hmm. Does that alarm you at all? Well, science fiction is unlike uh, advocacy for industry. Science fiction is a literature of case studies, mm -hmm. starting right back with Mary Shelley and Frankenstein, which was the first synthetic bio case study. So let's do this and see if it's a good idea. Oh, it actually wasn't in that particular case. The interesting thing about Mary Shelley's case was actually she was, you know, uh, Frankenstein's widely taught not just as a first book in science fiction courses, but also in a lot of bioethics courses and in women's studies courses. It's particularly taught in women's studies because her message was that without compassion that women bring to the creation of life, men, Victor, not Victoria Frankenstein, but Victor Frankenstein would bring a lack of compassion to the notion of synthetic biology. Uh, so uh, in science, as a science fiction writer, you look at individual cases and you say, sometimes this is going to be frightening, and frightening tends to make a better story than not frightening. Other times, it's going to be terrific. Uh, the classic science fictional example from films, now 25 years old, is the Genesis uh, effect in the Genesis planet in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, where, where Spock refuses to evaluate, it's, I'm not attempting to evaluate its moral ethics, McCoy says, we're talking about universal Armageddon with this machine, and Dr. Carol Marcus thinking it's the most wonderful thing in the universe to be able to create life from, as she says, lifelessness. And science fiction will give you that panoply of answers to the question. Do I personally fear it? I think there's no point in fearing the future. The future is going to come regardless. It's like fearing Christmas. It's going to be here December 25th, whether you like it or not, so you might as well learn to live with it. Actually, I guess the question I'd raise about that analogy is uh, Christmas does always come on December 25th, whereas I'm not sure it's inevitable how soon we get to certain oh, thresholds. No, no, okay, that's science. right. And, right, and you know, okay. Bill Joy in this famous, some years ago, uh, piece in Wired, The Future Doesn't Need Us, um, recommended that we uh, basically halt scientific inquiry in some along some avenues because it was so dangerous. Right, I don't. You, you had eight years of that here under George Bush, and how's that working out for you? <laughs> uh, it, it, it is by far, it, by a long shot, not the most objectionable thing I found about uh, those eight years. <laughs> but um, fair enough. Uh, the um, you know what we. We do have, what, the point you make, I mean, of course he didn't halt scientific progress, but the point you make is, is the point yeah, I'd like yeah. to highlight. We have some control over the rate yeah. of technological uh, progress. You, you have some control, you mentioned 
George Bush, you have some control in the United States over the rate of technological progress. You have very little control over the rate of technological progress in China or North Korea or the former right. uh, Russia. Right. Uh, there are the, the problem with trying to do governance of right. any emerging technology yeah. is either you opt in, you're part of it, mm -hmm. or you opt out and let other people do it. But we don't or, have a world government that well, says, or nobody does or it because we're uncomfortable with that. Or you move toward global governance, but that is such a hobby horse of mine that I will nobly resist the impulse to deliver a sermon <laughs> uh, on the importance of it and instead turn to uh, our policy guy, uh, Dan. And, you know, if you, if you want to pick up there, you could. I, I know that you think that there's something um, a little too, too simple about framing it as promise versus peril, but if I could encourage you to, to think about peril for just one moment. Um, uh, oh, I have no problem thinking about peril. You have peril. no problem thinking about no. peril. You're just the man I'm looking for, yes. then. Um, <laughs> if, you, if you fail to, to scare people, I'm willing to intervene and, and try, to, try to help, but... Well, we have a science fiction writer who can help us with that. Uh, he, did, so, he, didn't, so. he didn't terrify them I'm quite as much as I had hoped. Sure. I'm an optimist amongst my, my colleagues. We have some of the optimistic guys here. So we turn to you. Yeah, so... Um, the, the, the problem I have with the promise or peril uh, framing is it, is it makes it look like um, technologies d deliver their uh, impacts in little discrete bites. Um, it cures a disease or it causes an oil spill or it kills a person. Um, and in fact, I mean, the consequences of technology uh, that, that matter most are not about the little individual discrete things they do, but about the systemic ways that they transform society and culture. And um, those the, the, the waves of technological change that sweep across society, they're known to economists as creative destruction for very good reason. Uh, they create wealth, they create new industries, they create opportunity, they create social progress, and at the same time, they destroy what was in their path. That includes destroying, that means destroying jobs, they can destroy uh, cultures, they can destroy social relations. Uh, so uh, I think the right way to look at something uh, as potentially transformative as Synbio, and I should say, uh, I think it's very important to, to, for everybody to recognize that, that part of what we're hearing here is the hype of a technology whose future is unknown. It may turn out to be uh, as transformative and wonderful as its advocates say. It may turn out to be uh, largely a disappointment. Who knows? Or maybe transformative and horrible. It could all, well, uh, I think things tend to be uh, both horrible and wonderful depending on which side of the, uh, of the wave of transformation one sits. And uh, so I think part of the problem that we've had in the past in terms of managing uh, and governing emerging technologies is, is our efforts to, uh, to govern them in a kind of piecemeal way with, with risk-benefit analysis that quantifies particular, uh, particular impacts rather than thinking systemically about how waves of technology transform uh, society. Let me, just, let me just say, I mean, one of the things that I think separates uh, the, the types of, of scenarios about technological futures that science fiction writers do uh, from what, uh, what, what advocates for particular technologies might do is, is science fiction writers think about uh, what a technology means when embedded in a society given the limits uh, of human behavior and human emotions and human psychology and institutions. And, um, for example, in the, in the story that we heard uh, from the first speaker about, uh, about the emergence of, um, of computer technologies, uh, it was sort of an immaculate conception. Uh, there was no mention of the institutional uh, setting, of the, the markets, of the applications, of the choices that were made that all determined the trajectories that the, uh, that the technology would take. So, uh, so the, the problem I have with promise or peril is uh, it way oversimplifies and feeds into a tendency to just look at technology as something that does something in some local domain rather than as, as a part of a very societally transforming set of phenomena. Yeah, and, and of course it'll have different, different effects depending on, on whose hands um, it's in and what they want to do. I should flesh out a little the Bill Joy scenario I, re I referred to. I mean, I think among the things he was worried about. Um, this was actually before 9-11, I think, that, that piece. Yeah, yeah, so um, the, 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 maybe the, we have a sharper focus on this question now. But, um, you know, in principle, if you were a terrorist, uh, you know, use your imagination. I mean, um, 
you, you might want to um, design a, a microorganism that afflicts um, conceivably a particular ethnic group. Um, there's all kinds of things uh, you can imagine, uh, but uh, that's the kind of um, concern that, that's out there. I, I, I think that after the early years of, 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 of recombinant DNA work, initially there was the fear that you'd be doing stuff in a lab and things would just go out of control. Oops, the, the world is gone. And, and I think that is, strikes pretty much everyone as a lot less plausible now. And, 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 and that may not change with synthetic biology, but I think um, you know, the intentionally malicious use of it uh, is something that's of concern. And uh, as, as you've suggested, yeah. it's very hard to regulate um, at the national level. Now, George, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, that's a good sign. I can hear you. I, I, first, I just, I just ask, surely people confront you with this question, right? I mean, surely you've, you've heard this, this fear that uh, someone would use this technology maliciously, try to design a microorganism that would uh, wipe out lots of people or all of them or, or something or, or use it in some other nefarious way. Is, is it a, a concern that, that you think is overblown? No, I think we, we need to take these quite seriously. Uh, in particular, it's not sufficient to just monitor, say, the companies, and it's not sufficient to just deal with voluntary uh, <clears throat> methodology. I think, I think we need active surveillance of, of all possible participants, and it doesn't have to be unilateral. It's something that, that, can, that can and is uh, already happening. Uh, by getting um, uh, companies to, to, to buy in uh, to this uh, internationally before their governments uh, have, have a chance to, to, uh, to, to, de to decide. And then uh, to get uh, customers to, to go along with uh, whatever the international norms that are safer uh, and, and, then, and then government can jump in at any moment and, and, and uh, contribute as well. Uh, but it helps to have some movement internationally, uh, multilaterally, uh, by any method we can. Okay. Um, and I guess I'm kind of wondering, given the presentation we saw, whether, uh, whether that's enough. I mean, I have this image of kids working in, in, in their basement, able to order this, this stuff, um, you know, mail order uh, the components. And I think the whole, the whole point of synthetic biology is that it's not as if you can deny them access to particularly uh, threatening forms of life. The, the whole point is there's not that many building blocks, right, as I understand it. And once you've got access to all the building blocks, if you have sufficient knowledge, you can in principle do anything. And, 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 and it seems to me that, that, that well, 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 Rob is, uh, is gesturing as if he has yeah, something well, to say here. So. What's the farthest idea that people have gone with in science fiction? The farthest ideal is, idea is that this, us, all of us, are a synthetic bio experiment from some super advanced kid who's got a garage bio lab uh, out there in the multiverse, and are all you, of are us are. Theological on us now uh, here. That's that's your take, uh, <laughs> Bob. I read Non-Zero: The Logic of Human Destiny. He didn't introduce himself, but uh, probably your best-known book, Non-Zero: The Logic of Human Destiny, by uh, Robert Wright. Uh, and you shade towards that near the end of it. I'm avoiding using a theological language here, uh, although we are playing God. I mean, the subtitle of Frankenstein, Mary Shelley's book Frankenstein, is Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. Stealing fire from the gods is what we're talking about here. Um, when, but you're exactly right when you say the kit of parts is something that you cannot regulate. You cannot say that you cannot buy these four base pairs. Right. People are going to buy it, and what you do with them is going to be wide, wide open. It's interesting you introduced me as a science fiction writer primarily and a Canadian secondarily. Um, I think in some ways being a Canadian is more significant here. I was once asked to contribute to a libertarian science fiction anthology, and I had to tell the editor I don't think it's technically possible to be both a Canadian and a libertarian. Uh, <laughs> The issue of governance and oversight is bred in the bones of Canadians. We do this. We, have, we, we don't believe in uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We believe in our founding document, peace, order, and good government. And uh, there has to be oversight for this. But how you can over, have oversight of something that is so basically simple is very, very difficult. What the oversight should be, I don't know. Should there be oversight? Absolutely. 
George, if you can hear me, do you have any thoughts on that? That, that you know, once you've got these basic, uh, you know, building blocks, um, and, and, and they are accessible, and knowledge tends to diffuse and be hard to contain, that in, in some sense, uh, it's hard to imagine how you stop any really smart person from doing what they want. Maybe. Maybe, maybe we're just as well off not knowing the answer to that question anyway. <laughs> he knows. He's just he knows. He has a knowing look. Has that look yes. George, can you hear us? I, I think after a while you take that as a no. Um, <laughs> well, well I, I will jump in here if, I, if George sure. is not. I mean, <clears throat> a, a couple of things strike me. For, first is, you know, there's no limits to the surveillance state at this point. If we really want everybody oh, to be okay. surveilled. I'm sorry. Uh, there's, a, there's an eight-second delay on one and it's garbled on the other. I hope I'm not interrupting now, but uh, yeah, I, I think the, the key thing is not is it's very difficult and not desirable to to prevent uh, these uh, all sorts of innovation, but our ability to uh, do surveillance can get better and better. And there's all sorts of things that you, that that currently can be done in in kitchens, like manufacturing of of uh, illegal illegal drugs. Which, which are subject to surveillance. And I would argue that synthetic biology is, if, if anything, slightly easier because there are bottlenecks that don't exist uh, in other synthetic chemistry, such as the phosphoramidites and, the, and the, uh, the instruments that people use for building them. And I think it's, it's really, it, the stakes are even higher than, than, than it is for uh, uh, psychoactive drugs. So I, 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 th I think it's something where we won't restrict the innovation, but we will make sure that, that that we know what everybody's doing. And if somebody is specifically doing something without announcing transparently to the world what they're doing, I think that's a tip off right there. Yeah, okay, um, let me um, ask you one quick follow up, George, and then we're gonna um, turn to, to Dan. Um, the, 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 uh, the question is, I don't know much about the kind of machinery that, that, that uh, is inherently involved in this in, in the near future, but is it sufficiently complicated if you really wanna do something big in this field, create a whole new uh, life form, even at the single cell level. Um, is the equipment you need sufficiently complicated that in principle we could have a law that says, say, you can't, it's illegal to possess equipment like, to ma manufacture or possess equipment like this unless it has within it monitoring equipment that, that tells us what is being done with that equipment, something like that. So, so kind of a built-in surveillance um, in the, again, this would ultimately have to be international, I guess, if it were to be effective, but leaving that aside, is the, is the equipment so complicated that, that, that that is a bottleneck? In other words, it's not like making drugs in a bathtub. You, you don't just go buy the stuff uh, at the hardware store. And I think within eight seconds, uh, George may have thoughts on this. Yeah, I think that that is, that it's not that complicated, but it could be nevertheless made, uh, it, there are some choke points that could be capitalized and made a little bit uh, more regulatable, more uh, e easier to s do surveillance, at least for a few years while we get better feeling for what the uh, risks and benefits actually are. I think it's very desirable, the sort of scenario that you painted uh, of, of Focusing on what we can do to increase the, uh, uh, the the surveillance and not depend entirely on voluntary uh, transparency. But any anyone that's that's going outside of that clearly is sending a message. You, you know, it's a little bit like the fact that uh, scanners now have built into them chips that prevent them from scanning banknotes. If they see a banknote, they won't scan it. If and your color printers all actually watermark color printouts because if you're scanning and printing a banknote, it actually, there's a, there's a serial number watermark, usually printed in yellow on white, like the Google there, very, very small. We have that technology built in at the assistance of the United you States government. Recognize a banknote. Recognize note American banknotes. You can counterfeit Canadian banknotes, but not American ones, <laughs> <laughs> because uh, this is required for the sale of commercial printers in the United States and scanners in the United States. It's not widely advertised, but it's required. You can easily weed out the amateurs who want to circumvent the law. The 
professional criminals in always find ways around us. So what we will do is not have to worry about the 14-year-old kids creating the virus that's going to wipe out humanity because there will be the safeguards in the, the, the gene sequencers that you'll go and buy at CVS or wherever, at your local drugstore, uh, or your gene writers, excuse me, that you'll buy at CVS. But there will always be ways for the professional terrorist, the professional criminal to circumvent this kind of uh, technology. The, 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 cutting, the cutting edge people. Yeah, which, which is why, again, I think this, um, you know, the promise or peril framing isn't that, that useful. It's easy to, 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 to uh, uh, drift <clears throat> into either totally utopian or totally dystopian uh, views of what's going to happen with the technology, but obviously it's, gonna, it's, it's going to be a mix. And, and the things that present themselves as very concrete, immediate risks, I think, will, uh, will be addressed. The much more difficult problem uh, is, the, is the big picture systemic stuff. I mean, you think about something like antibiotics, which, which seem like such an unalloyed uh, uh, benefit boon to mankind, and you think about the long-term uh, consequences of, of uh, attempts to control uh, disease pathologies, infectious disease, using uh, antibiotics and, its, and, then the, and the breeding of uh, superorganisms and and, uh, and, and the complexities that that introduces into the, into the medical system. I think that's the sort of, that's a too easy example of the sort of imagination that we need to actually uh, begin to exercise here uh, to, uh, to address some of, these, um, some of these complex consequences. Because it's not, it's not just the obvious threats. Um, it's not the obvious threats we have to deal with because those are the obvious threats. Uh, it's, the, it's the way that SynBio will unfold in society, and I think we just really need to attend to the, 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 the reality that technologies are social creations. They're not just these things that get thrown out uh, uh, in, in, for, for our use. They ex exist within contexts, uh, and we need to understand and address those contexts. And that's what one of the things that science fiction writers are so, uh, are so good at and policy wonks are so bad at. Okay. The, uh, I guess a, maybe a final question on how you handle kind of downside, uh, the downside part is, is if it's so hard to anticipate the specific um, perils, is, is there a case for trying to adjust the sheer rate of technological change? The idea being that there's a rate of change beyond which the countermeasures cannot keep up with, with, with the threats that are surfacing. And, Again, nobody's buying into the, the Bill Joy, very few people, the, 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 the extreme version of the Bill Joy scenario of, of just halting scientific inquiry along certain paths. But on the other hand, governments do, do certain things to actively increase the rate uh, of technological change in certain areas. And in some cases, they do it for, for the best of uh, reasons, and it w might even have positive payoffs. But at the same time, uh, it might in the long run um, be uh, a little perilous. I'm just wondering if any of you uh, have thoughts about, you know, rate of technological change uh, as, as a thing you might try to actively uh, adjust. Yeah, what, what, you, what you really want to, I mean, ideally, I think you would adjust it so that you could catch up. But that's very difficult to do. So what you really want to adjust is your capacity to think through what's going on. Mm -hmm. And one way you do that is you start really early to talk about possible future scenarios. I mean, this sort of meeting would not have happened 20 years ago around ag biotech or 40 years ago around nukes. And uh, so building in a capacity to deliberate, to bring all of the different sectors and institutions and perspectives uh, who have something to say about uh, an emerging technology is one way to increase the social intelligence around governance. So, um, so I, I would certainly would have, I think this, to, to, to use uh, uh, Bill Joy's term, would have no philosophical objections to tapping the brakes. I don't think we're very good at knowing how to do that. Uh, but I think we are, uh, we, we are naturally able uh, to diversify the, and complexify the discussions around these technologies by expanding what counts as expertise. And I think that's what we're doing here today, and I think that's a really important tool. George, do you have any thoughts on the, on the rate of change question? Tell me when, way that or, or, the, or the rate at which information is transmitted from yeah. uh, Washington to Boston. Well, the, sorry for the delay. The rate of change question is uh, 
is very difficult to control. It, that would be something that I think you can get inter international agreement. It, that it's a uh, it's it's easy to relatively easy to to regulate uh, surveillance uh, and to get some international agreement on that. I think it's very hard to get all every every player to uh, to crank back on a particular technology. Uh, it tends to go forward and then everybody copies. Uh, but it certainly is something worth considering and and discussing in 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 settings like like this one was look. And looking very far forward is definitely protective, and 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 I think it's great. Can I just follow up with one quick sure. point, which is is I think it's important to note that that um, George and I are talking about very two different two very different types of governance. One is formal through national and international agreements, and another is a is a evolving social capacity to actually engage in discussions about what's going on and build that into into the, a culture of decision making and. Uh, so we need to pursue both, uh, but we typically ignore the latter. Yeah, I agree with that. I think the, the, however, that science fiction's role has long been to contextualize things in the human condition. As Asimov's definition, the responses of human beings to changes in science and technology is what he defines science fiction as. But uh, again, I'll make a little Canadian comment here. Canada was the third country in the world to launch something into space. Sputnik, the Soviets were first, America second, Canada was first, third with our satellite Alouette. And then we decided too expensive for a small country to have its own launch vehicle industry. We also opted out of big particle physics, too expensive. What we found is that biotech, not only when it started, but certainly uh, within a very few years afterwards, was something that countries with much smaller economies than the United States could have a major role in. And what we see here is it's not a superpower industry, biotech. It's going to be an industry where little countries that missed out on previous technological revolutions are able to say, this is one that we can get in on the ground floor of, or whatever floor we're up to now, the second floor of this infinite skyscraper of biotech. And uh, that is what makes international consultation interesting, but it's just like trying to say to China right now, you know, you really should be putting in pollution controls and everything. No, 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 we're leapfrogging into the 21st century and you can't stop us from leapfrogging. Canada's gonna do this and you're gonna see countries that we think of as second tier technological or third tier technological nations deciding this is where they're gonna put their money and move their, their young people and emphasize their educational programs into SynthBio and biotech because the cost of doing it, the entry level cost now and certainly by the end of this decade is so low for doing major work. And that makes international agreement hard. It's easy for the big countries, the big rich countries, the scientific and technological leaders to say, okay, let's as you say, tap the brakes in a Bill Joy fashion. It's hard to say to a country that's looking to jump ahead to primacy mm -hmm. in an area of science and technology that you guys got to put the brakes on too when they're saying, no, no, this is our chance to catch up. Okay, and if experience is any guide, uh, people who are looking for government subsidies in this field will be emphasizing exactly what you're talking about, that if we don't do it, the Chinese will do it. Right. But that's, <clears throat> that's not to say that, that, that government subsidy never uh, has a legitimate role. And I'd like to kind of turn to that question, kind of the upside, whether there are things that we should be encouraging, uh, which for one reason or another, the market uh, is not attending to. Um, and, uh, you know, specific thing, you know, uh, if there's a specific kind of payoff, a specific disease that might be cured, uh, s you know, sooner if we focus on it and warrants that kind of emphasis by virtue of the number of people it afflicts or something like that, um, and uh, I think I'm going to ask, and I think I've now learned to wait about actually 12 seconds after asking the questions uh, of George and not intervening after eight seconds, which only throws him off once he started to answer. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll ask uh, George and then patiently wait, wait um, for, for the answer. Are, are there things, are, are there places where you think the public interest really demands a more concerted uh, government effort than we've seen? Oh, sorry. Uh, okay, uh, sorry for the delay. Uh, I I think in terms of uh, 
of, of biotech applied to medicine, we're, we're already seeing an uh, increased number of personalized medicines, uh, diagnostics going together with therapeutics for cancer and many other things. And, we'll, and we, we hope to see this not only happening in the developed nations, but in developing nations as well. Uh, the, the world's poorest people also have, uh, have uh, diseases and, and treatments and so forth, which can, ha can have disastrous effects if they're treated in a one-size-fits-all. This is uh, a, a future of synthetic biology. The present is making less expensive drugs like artemisinin and then trying to get those out into the uh, countries that have uh, malarial problems uh, among their poorest people. I, I think we could go on. There are many, many opportunities with uh, uh, the smart pharmaceuticals that I unfortunately didn't define earlier, where, where they, they actually can sense the environment they're in and be very, very targeted rather than dosing the entire body, just doing local dosing. Okay. Um, and, and I'm sure that there's a certain amount of nonprofit support for that. I'm sure that uh, this has not escaped the, atten the attention of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, for example. Um, what about uh, the environment and, 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 and the, uh, the, the question of, of clean energy, George? I don't, I don't know that this is a specific focus of yours, but I'm sure... Um, you know, you, you get asked about this, and in reading on on this subject, I've seen some uh, some estimates that are said to be plausible uh, that uh, about you know dramatic uh, impact on on issues like climate change that are that are possible um, through this technology. And of course, you know, in Washington, this this has been kind of the the, the libertarian. Uh, line all along is be patient technology will solve uh, the problem um, and uh, I, I'm wondering George if, 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 if you think a problem like, like climate change might wind up having a sheerly uh, technological uh, fix although of course there's, there's a time lag uh, in, in with climate change uh, as, as there is as, much like the one we're about to see if you could um, address the, the question George. So, uh, climate change, uh, whether you think that it's uh, human or not, uh, it, it is, uh, the carbon dioxide levels uh, have an impact, and there are routes to increasing our ability to uh, fix carbon and turn it into uh, usable substances, not just fuels, but, um, but building materials and so on, which in a way is carbon sequestration. But rather than sequestering it into some place where it's not useful, having it uh, available for um, for building materials and so on, this the, the cyanobacteria do this about ten times more efficiently than the best agricultural species uh, crops, and the, and those best crops do it better, you know, orders of magnitude better than the worst. So there really is a huge opportunity here, and using marginal lands, as I mentioned earlier, that that otherwise would turn into deserts. Uh, um, but can't be used uh, with current agriculture. So these, this is big impact uh, on producing alternatives to petroleum, which we're using up, uh, and green chemistry in general. Uh, at, and your question of whether I was involved a little bit, uh, uh, mainly to, through the Department of Energy and uh, two uh, startups, LS9 and Juul. LS9 just got the Presidential EPA Green Chemistry Award this year. Okay, thank you. Any, any climate change thoughts or energy thoughts? Uh, I don't from want to get me started on climate change, but I may not be able to stop myself, but just I'll, one... I'll be, I'll be in charge of stopping You'll be in charge of stopping Why don't you handle okay. the start part? Right. Okay, so, um, uh, I mean, I think a, a, a key point here is that um, I, I guess I don't agree with your characterization of, of, of understanding climate okay, change stop, as a technological, stop, stop. As a technological <laughs> uh, problem is libertarian. In fact, it will have technological solutions on the, on the dealing with carbon dioxide end. Um, and this is, this is exactly the sort of complex uh, socio-technical system problem that I've been, been trying to, to uh, get everyone to obsess about along with me. Um, and it turns out that it's incredibly difficult uh, to take a highly embedded uh, global technological system like the energy system and make it something else so that it will have an output that we care, that, that we're, a particular output that we care about, which is uh, less, less carbon emissions. So to the extent that, um, that synthetic biology offers the possibility 
uh, of fuels that are going to be able to lead to that transition. I think uh, that's something that we ought to take extremely seriously. That being said, we also ought to take, we also ought to approach it with the same skepticism that we uh, now can use towards uh, claims that uh, ag biotech would cure, uh, would cure global hunger. Not because ag biotech is not a powerful uh, magnifier of agricultural productivity, but because these are social systems uh, that, uh, that create all sorts of obstacles to change that are beyond simply the technological capabilities. So again, uh, uh, if, if we don't attend to both the social systems the so and the political systems as well as the technology, uh, we're going to find ourselves disappointed. Uh, so we need to understand uh, the types of technological systems that we're trying to replace um, and not just say that because we will create synthetic fuels, suddenly the problems will go away. Climate change or energy thoughts? Well, um, since it's Washington, D.C., and I'm a visitor here and I've got the chance to say it, it's human caused, okay? Listen, it's human caused. We have to deal with that. Uh, the second issue there, I think, is that, yes, this may be a use for synthetic bio, but it isn't in the minds of the public who is going to respond positively or negatively to regulation what the key issue is. The key issue is health. The key issue is longevity. The key issue is quality of personal life, uh, curing cancer, curing Alzheimer's, curing all these things. And I think that is going to be the prime mover. I was asked, actually, when Bill Joy did his article in Wire, uh, The Future Doesn't Need Us, to rebut it or to respond to it for the Globe and Mail, Canada's national newspaper. sfwriter.com slash joy.htm is my rebuttal. And my point to him then, and it is my point now, is you can't put the brakes on anything related to biotech if you know anybody in your life who has Alzheimer's, who has heart disease, who has breast cancer, you can't possibly be so heartless metaphorically to say this is a technology that is too dangerous. And when we start saying, well, let's focus on uh, what it might do for climate change, or let's focus for, we all cons are concerned about global hunger, but those are, for most people in their day-to-day -day lives, abstract issues. What's going to drive governance and what's going to drive the public dialogue is how it's actually going to affect health for people here in the first world. Can, can I just add a dimension to that? Because if you think about the, the, the say, the, the um, uh, embryonic stem cell debate, okay, and try to back off a, a little bit from one's ideological uh, views about the prior administration um, and instead think about that as, uh, as a problem of governance. Right? Well, what you see is different countries approaching uh, stem cell research in different ways, partly as a result of very different, the de very different moral, ethical, and political and cultural commitments that they have. In Germany, uh, killing embryos is not allowed. And I bet that it's not very hard for people in this audience to have a kind of empath empathic understanding for why that makes sense in Germany, okay? Now, here it was a huge political issue and we saw it as the efforts of the right-wing nutcases to, to uh, interfere with, si with, with the rationality and the freedom of science, okay? So these things are, um, are, are culturally uh, situated, but the point is that as a result of that, science is better, not worse, okay? Uh, it's better that there are disagreements about what counts as uh, a good way to intervene in human health, what the moral limits of certain types of science might be, because that leads to a diversity of explorations of avenues for doing things like curing disease. So, so um, I guess what, what I want to say is that, that while I think it's true, that, uh, that it's very hard to put the brakes on human aspiration to cure suffering and pain. Why would we want to do that? Uh, the ways that that gets constructed in different countries is very, very different. And that's actually good for science, even though it's often discussed within a, a particular context as bad because it means we're restricting what scientists to do. Let me, let me pause for a tangential sociological question. I'm just curious, is it true that uh, science fiction writers in general, Rob, tend to have a libertarian bias, in which case you as a Canadian science fiction writer, I would think would be a very unpopular person among <laughs> science fiction writers. But I is know, I've got my friends, people like me. Um, I, you know, there's a, there, uh, there are more libertarians in the science fiction community, readers and writers, than there are in the general population, but they are no, by no means the majority. 
okay? Uh, there's simply a large vocal minority within science fiction. Uh, there's this general, uh, you know, I don't, don't want to get into a big sociological thing, but there's this general um, misfit culture about being a science fiction person mm -hmm. and people who don't fit in well don't like rules and regulations that are defined for the majority. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a natural psychological drift towards libertarianism. I would, have, I would have thought it also had to do with, with uh, an exuberance about the possibilities of the future being something that, that gets you into science fiction as, as well. Well, absolutely, very much so. We all, uh, many of us, were very excited about, you know, we saw 2001 when it came right. out in 1968 and thought that was a promissory note that in 2001 we would have were, cities happy, on the moon. You were happy about the way we things worked out. We were happy about the way, it, okay. what, it was going to, what it was going to be. We thought this is what the future was going to okay. hold for, for kids who saw that film in the 60s, like myself. Um, but there are a lot of science fiction writers on the whole range of the spectrum. I'm a, uh, uh, on the, the, the left, Kim Stanley Robinson is on the left, we both write about governance and uh, biotech and other, and I write a lot about the internet and so forth. There are other people uh, on the right. It is a dialogue and what makes science fiction interesting is that it's a dialogue between opposing points of view within the genre. You've got uh, the, the classic example is Joe Haldeman and uh, Robert Heinlein on whether or not war is an ennobling thing and, uh, mm -hmm. and clearly uh, there's a dialogue there. And it is I, out I of that the dialogue Canadian, the value I know the Canadian goes. position on that, by the way. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So I think that uh, in science fiction, we do have this trope that goes right back to Mary Shelley, which is that you can do science without government at all, mm -hmm. right? Victor Frankenstein was not subject to any oversight or really any, uh, any judicial consequences for what he did. Mm -hmm. He just decided, you know what, I can create life in my basement laboratory, so I shall. Mm -hmm. And that will be the nature of science. And we have that template that's gone ever since, for almost 200 years now, we're coming up to the Frankenstein bicentennial in 2018. Mm -hmm. Escaped my attention had I not had I not been sitting next to you. Um, it won't in 2018, believe me. Uh, the uh, okay. So as long as we're talking science fiction, I'd like to uh, I, I'd like to move from one-celled uh, human-built uh, organisms to multi-celled uh, or organisms and, and and look a little further into the future. Now, in, in one sense, this is not so far out into the future. And reading up on this, I somebody apparently. Uh, has a plan to recreate woolly mammoths yes. by uh, in, in inserting the a reconstructed woolly mammoth genome into an elephant egg, and uh, uh, I guess this could work. And I guess um, someday you could actually uh, wouldn't need to be you wouldn't be reconstructing some organism, wouldn't need the the egg to put it in. I guess someday you you could. Uh, just just build the thing from the ground up, uh, not 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 a reconstructed organism, but an invented, multi-celled organism. Uh, and I think uh, George is the person uh, best positioned to tell us uh, whether that's crazy, and if it's not, how far off into the future uh, some of, some of these kinds of things are, George. Okay, uh, sorry, sorry for the delay. It's it's not uh, it's not that far off, and, it, and in fact, we just got a a, a major NIH grant for engineering human uh, genomes uh, in in uh, human adult uh, stem cells, and this is mainly for uh, sorting out the the hypotheses that are flowing out of genome projects at a at a huge rate. But it also clearly is setting the stage for uh, uh, better forms of gene therapy that don't uh, <clears throat> that don't involve random viral integration, which can cause cancer. Ways that you can do very uh, high quality, uh, very high, high quality constructions of, of genomes that that could uh, make cells multivirus resistant or more cancer resistant or or, or slower at aging. Um, if you're going to be getting a cell therapy anyway, as many people do for bone marrow or skin transplants on a regular basis, shouldn't those be of the highest quality cells you can get? And that might involve genome engineering. Uh, so this, the whole establishment of, of human uh, stem cells from adults, from skin or blood or a variety of tissues now, um, is really quite routine in many labs. And, and then the engineering of them precisely so that you put one change in one place in the genome is also 
uh, getting to be quite routine. So I, I, I think with the kind of exponentials we've been hearing about today, we can see this uh, changing quite significantly over the next couple of years. You have made an interesting point, though. You talked about not just modifying existing life, but de novo creating completely unique novel Multi organisms. Multi and, and Absolutely. And there are way more ways to be dead than there are to be alive. Most pregnancies spontaneously abort, mm -hmm. right? It's a reality that it really is very hard to make the chemistry of life work. So the notion that, you know, as a, a writer or a musician, I can just do a riff at my keyboard and come up with something that's right. unique and original and it's readable as text or it's playable as musical uh, on a musical instrument if I'm a composer, but it's not necessarily self-reproducible as a life form. It doesn't necessarily work. So we're going to see most of synthetic bio for a very long time is going to be shading and, and modifying existing life forms to tweak them to what we want. The notion that we're going to be very soon saying, okay, I've imagined in science fiction we have Larry Niven, a great creator of aliens. He's got the puppeteer, a three-legged thing with two arms with eyes on the end of each arm mm -hmm. that, okay, I want to make one of those in my lab where you're going to find that it's not just as Vetner had, you know, 99% failure rate, but a 99.999999 on for a couple of blocks of nines. Mm -hmm. uh, failure rate at trying to create things randomly because it really is very hard to get complex systems of systems, which is what a big organic life form is, to actually function on a macro scale that is living for, for years and decades and centuries. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I've been surprised in, in my reading to find how interchangeable the parts are, how, how neatly interchangeable. So you read about you know, a gene in a, co a, a cold water fish right. being put into a strawberry plant and conferring the same property, right. cold resistance on the strawberry. Uh, now that to me sounds like, oh, you know, I had a problem with my Volkswagen, so I grabbed something off my bicycle and put it in the engine and everything was, was fine. And of course, in that scenario, you're still modifying life. You're not creating life de novo. At the same time, that degree of interchangeability, in other words, the discreteness of the functionality yes. in the thing suggests to me uh, that uh, it's, uh, it, it may not be as hard as we think. Well, to, you know, you know. It's an interesting point, but setting aside the notion that maybe there's a shadow biosphere, you know, we have the arsenic-based life that recently was brought to, uh, to attention. Setting that aside, where our general consensus is that there's exactly one biogenesis event in the history of life on Earth, that 3.8 or 4.0 billion years ago, mm -hmm. life emerged and mm -hmm. that the DNA genome, the super genome of all life on this planet is mm -hmm. one a common descent, is mm -hmm. a common descent from one original creation, mm -hmm. uh, biological creation. Uh, and given that, the interchangeability of parts makes a certain amount of sense. Um, the idea that there are, uh, that you can start without that same suite of uh, history and, and make up parts that are going to plug in is a much more difficult problem. Also, there's the, the, the I mean, George should really a, yeah. address this, we, but, we, the, we will turn to him after but, this but the idea that, um, that you can, uh, from uh, substituting one particularly well, d discrete trait or transferring it from one species to another uh, gives you a predicted outcome is a completely different problem than the problem of actually assembling a complex system that is an organism. So I'm not even sure that, that, you, that, that those are uh, analogous. This, it's not a linear scale up. Um, uh, new parts that have no connection to that uh, mega genome that, 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 that we were talking about just a moment ago, that ancestral genome to which we all you can, you can make uh, new parts, new proteins, and new RNAs if you know how to select for them. They don't have to have any ancestry, um, and they can be plugged into current systems in a variety of ways. Uh, the key thing is knowing what you want, is, is having a selection for a functionality, uh, for an enzymatic uh, reaction that you want, or a particular shape that you want. Furthermore, we can build DNA nanostructures where you can actually just specify the shape. And, from, and then you have computer-aided design software, very similar to the kinds of CAD software you use for uh, automobiles, that will then make that shape at the atomically precise. And that tends to work pretty close the first time, unlike man, many other uh, CAD and, and, and molecular design tools. So, so you can make new parts fr from scratch uh, that have either enzymatic or other functions or shapes. 
Um, making g genomes from scratch, I think, is not that valuable, but it is really remarkable how uh, adaptable they are. Not just that they can use parts from other organisms, but that you can put in something that they didn't, that you wouldn't think that they're ready for, and they can do it. For example, you can put in a new photoreceptor into a mouse, and suddenly you can see a new color. And uh, and so I think that really. Uh, the adaptability of current genomes uh, means we don't have to change everything in order to have very radical effects, uh, and, and we're going to get at collectively much better at that. Mm -hmm. And, and um, George, have you thought much about, along that very line, uh, what kind of demand there's going to be, you know, among the human population? In other words, if the, if the market has its way in response to human uh, demands uh, to improve ourselves, I mean, I'd like to be able to see another color. I'd like to be able to see farther than I can see. I'd like there. I could go on all day about ways I'd like to be different, different and better. See without glasses. Um, could you give us a sense for what kinds of uh, capabilities people are going to, in principle, have within, say, 10, 15, 20 years to improve our, ourselves by these kinds of manipulation? and add additional uh, capabilities, and, and, and of those, the, the ones you think that people are going to be most interested in uh, endowing themselves with? Okay. Sorry for the delay. Uh, we have to keep in mind that our inheritance is not just DNA. Our evolution in, in includes uh, really excellent uh, electronic and other components. So when we say we'd like to see additional colors, we can already see the full, uh, the, the full uh, spectrum uh, of the electromagnetic uh, all the wavelengths uh, by augmenting with false colors or something else. I, and a lot of the things that would have been terrific dreams uh, several decades or centuries ago of superhuman strength or speed and so forth beca become less critical because we can go at high speeds with, with uh, cars and, and uh, rockets and so forth. And in a way, we're becoming a less physical species. So probably what we will want is a longer, healthier life and uh, possibly some augmentation to our mental capabilities, to be able to remember more than seven numbers at a time uh, in short-term memory, ability to access long-term memory, which might be ability to quickly access the entire Internet as if it feels to us as if it's our own memories. It's organized in a way that, and integrated with our, uh, our short-term memory so that we can quickly do that. That's something that, 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 that may be uh, quite desirable. The, the long, longer, healthier lives, society put such an investment into education now, our education is lasting longer and longer. Uh, it, it might be desirable to study the people who make it past 110 years old uh, in living uh, vibrant lives and, uh, and actually uh, abusing their bodies in various ways that, without uh, consequences. That might be something that was also of interest, to, and we can obtain some hints into that by looking at people that are already living that long. Okay. And, and a thought I would throw out without us probably having to dwell on it, unless maybe, Dan, you want to say something, is, uh, you know, what happens when these, uh, the, the, the potential for self-enhancement is left to the, to the market? And clearly, you know, it's always going to be the case that the, the newest, uh, greatest thing is uh, accessible to the people with the most money in the absence of... Uh, something way beyond Obamacare, I would say, in terms of in terms of what it, what it covers. Um, if anybody has thoughts on that, uh, they could weigh in. Now, I'm seeing well, a couple. Yeah, I mean, go ahead. Yeah, I do. I, the biggest area of self-enhancement currently is vanity, breast implants, teeth whitening, mm -hmm. uh, uh, hair implants, things like that. Number one thing people want to do is be attractive. It's a reality. Number two thing they want is given back what they used to have. I would like to have my hair back if it was easy and trivial to have it as, a, as a, a gene therapy to have it done. I would like to be able to see without these. When you said see another color, that was very interesting because you want to go beyond what you ever had. All I want back is what I had when I was young. 
And I think for most people, that, that, that's, that's a real qualitative difference. Most people, when they talk about what you can do for me, I just want what I used to have. They don't want to have webbed fingers so they can swim. They don't want to have wings so they can fly. They don't want to see in the infrared. They do want to be able to uh, abuse their body eating spicy food and not having to uh, deal with the consequences of that the way they could when they were young. They want to be able to cross time zones without being jet lagged the way they could when they were young. They want those things given back to them. And I think that's what's going to drive it. It's first vanity and second, just give me back what I used to have. And is, 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 uh, is spicy food a Canadian's idea of dangerous, <laughs> youthful excess? Uh, it's, our, uh, it's our solution. I, I went actually. to an American college, yeah. and, and maybe we should chat it's our afterwards. The energy crisis. Um, <laughs> the, the, uh, now, now uh, Andres, my, my taskmaster, I was, I was, we didn't talk about a Q&A session, but I noticed, uh, and we're running out of time, but I noticed a couple of hands in, in, in the audience. Should but I? Only a couple, because nobody has asked for three hands, you see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you think? Yeah. Sure, yeah. particularly uh, eager person right here. My name is Anne Rakuya Robbins. Uh, I just feel uh, quite a disconnect with this conversation. And I just wanted to, although I'm glad that we are having it, but I find it uh, difficult to be articulate in my thinking and even in my speaking with this heavy overlay of uh, digital, what I would call metaphor on this whole discussion. I don't think it's adequate for what we're trying to do. Um, and, I mean, the, the most uh, profound question is we don't even know what life is to begin with. So the idea that we're going to create it and, of course, who's going to be responsible for its death. And we live in a world where this is a little bit of the American disconnect where you have billions of people that are greatly creative and are not even in this discussion and you're talking about how you can live to be 100 years old or improve those kinds of things or make our very affluent life much better. This is a disconnect that I don't think is acceptable in this kind of conversation. I would okay. just like to make that point. Okay, thank you. We have one more question here and then uh, the, the woman who uh, you had your hand up some time and then, yes, sorry. Uh, in the, in the can I give 10 seconds of response to that? Because I, I, I think I was actually going to ask, let them both ask their questions and then okay, go around because right, right. we're close to the end and, and give you give you each like 90 seconds if if I can do that. Um. Hi, my name is Rachel Oswald. Um, to your point that um, people would be more likely to choose self enhancement, beauty, um, get back what they had. I would offer back to you the movie Gattaca. Um, if you haven't seen it, but where you did yes, see, seen of it. course, <laughs> very excellent movie. But I, to me, it seems very clear that people would choose to enhance, ask for you know memory enhancers. We already have those drugs in the marketplace, and I, I think it definitely confers an advantage to the already wealthy. If you can extend your memory, you're going to have better access to jobs and people who can't afford these memory enhancers, and. It seems to me self-evident people would not stop at just getting back what they had, what they lost due to you know growing age. I agree they won't stop at that, but their first priority will be getting back what they have. And uh, Larry and Sergey did a wonderful job of enhancing my memory and everybody else's on the planet. I don't actually need to monkey around with the biochemistry of my brain to know everything the human race knows and to know it with a retrieval time of about five seconds. Uh, and to your point of view, very good point. I think absolutely these parallels, although it's cute, cell phone and cell is a very uh, interesting way to start the conversation. In fact, they're very different technologies. We saw just this past week that Egypt could decide to say, you know what, we're not going to be an internet country anymore for a couple of hours or days as they shut that down. There's no master switch that Obama can throw and say, you know what, we're not doing biotech anymore in this country. They're completely different kinds of enterprises, and they have very, very different uh, ways that you have to approach the governance of them. I think absolutely. Okay. Dan, closing thoughts in response yeah, to I, either? I also, um, I mean, I, sh I actually share your uh, di discomfort, and hopefully that we'll get, we'll get into these issues as the day uh, progresses, but I think the point about the technology being aimed towards uh, vanity and money uh, is right. It's what we see. It's why uh, continually the promises that new technologies will cure this problem or that end up uh, in many cases uh, frustrating our, our expectations. And it's why uh, governance is necessary uh, and, and important.
important, just as one particular example, again, just revisiting uh, ag biotech, which was supposed to solve, um, supposed to solve uh, uh, global hunger. Um, of course, in this country, it's been used as a way to enormously um, enhance the uh, productivity of, of large uh, agricultural companies, which is fine. Uh, but in fact, innovation in ag biotech is mostly ground to halt, not because of those goofy Europeans who still want to have uh, tomatoes that taste like tomatoes, but because the uh, intellectual property thicket around ag biotech is so incredibly complicated that nobody can actually figure out how to innovate within it anymore, which is an effort to govern. So, so um, the point I want to leave everyone with is, is it's not just about the technology, it's about the technologies in society. And you can go all over town and hear other meetings about visionary technologies. It's very difficult to know how these things are going to unfold because these are social phenomena, not just the phenomena of brilliant people like George Church working in laboratories. Speaking of George Church, <clears throat> I think we'll give uh, him, him uh, the last word. George, uh, have anything you want to say? Okay, sorry for the delay again. Uh, the, I, I completely agree with the comment about the disconnect. I don't think this conversation is disconnected in that we are drawing attention to uh, things that need to be considered. If there is market forces that it's, that's focusing on, on uh, health, healthy long life, even if that uh, is tested, if the original guinea pigs on that are the wealthier nations, they will be uh, bad consequences for the for the wealthy as they test out new technologies and with hopefully with a delay they 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 the good aspects will make it uh, into many nations and i think we also had some balance in the conversation by talking about all the things like uh clean water food roads education which which can have uh, uh technological and do have technological components so i think that that, that we have to be mindful of 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 all of these things uh, I don't really think there's a disconnect uh, in in any particular country or in this conversation. It's, but you can't really plan if you ignore a particular type of market force, um, and you need to uh, embrace as an early uh, uh, effort uh, all of the all of the uh, aspects of of developing as well as uh, industrialized nation. I should mention that some of these long-lived individuals do live in, in fairly uh, impoverished environments. Um, it's not entirely a, uh, something you study only in the developing nations, which have uh, very bad health habits. Okay, thank you. And I might add in closing, you mentioned uh, bad consequences for the wealthy early adopters. Um, another kind of bad consequence might be if things go very well for them in terms of the early adoption, but if there's a lot of resentment among uh, people who are poor and, and don't have them, whether uh, at home or uh, abroad. Uh, sorry about the, the ideological subtext of that comment. The, um, I want to thank everyone. Um, George, I want to thank you in particular for enduring the time delay. I think as time delay communication goes, this went fairly uh, well. I mean, there, there's apparently, uh, it's apparently a true fact documented in the Nantucket Library in the documents from the whaling era that one time, um, a, you know, it took like six, eight weeks to get a letter to a ship, and the wife of a whaler sent a letter that said, where is the ax? And however many weeks later, she got the reply that said, why do you want to know? <laughs> and I just thought this went a lot better than that. Um, uh, and I want to thank everyone for being um, so, so, so patient, and, and George for his insights, you for your insights. Before I ask people, um, to give you a round of applause, I want to mention uh, our next uh, speaker. We're, uh, we're going to move from organic digital information back to electronic digital information and, and hear a little about the internet from Bruce Gottlieb, who is the uh, uh, general counsel of Atlantic Media and uh, was at the FCC for five years, uh, most recently as chief counsel and senior legal advisor to the chairman. Okay, now you can give uh, our panelists their well-deserved <laughs>